find his third movie, quite frankly. What is it, like, so-and-so on a park bench? Guy and Madeline on a park... I don't even know if it's a real movie. Like, it... I, No, I've heard it's a musical. Uh, I've, well, heard it's like, I, I've heard... I think it's, like, a really? black and white 90 minutes. Yeah, musical. but, like, I think hmm. it was, like, his senior thesis for Harvard or something. Mm. <laughs> so I, I'm... I'm unclear as to as to whether that's like I a I real might, movie. I might seek it out. Who knows? Who knows? It's, it, it sounds intriguing. It's probably in the deep dark corners of the internet, but not too. Well, everything's in, in the deep dark corners, corners deep. of the internet. It's just how easy is it to find in the deep dark corners of the internet? I I would. The entire the entire internet is just corners. <laughs> it's nothing else. It's just corners. It's a circle. I, I feel like there needs it's to a be a piracy speed. database insofar <laughs> as like you type what you want, like whether it's a song or a movie, like into this database and it shows you go to this website. Oh. Avoid these websites. <laughs> these are scam. Uh, FYI, uh, Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench was actually released in in theaters. Oh, it, oh. it was going to be his uh, thesis film for Harvard, but he, he briefly left Harvard to focus on finishing it. Ooh. So saith Wikipedia. Um, anyway, welcome back to the Hack Fraud Show. Happy I, New Year. I do have an idea for, for a new intro. To ring in the new year, I say we ring the new intro. I was thinking the animals, um, oh shit, how am I blanking on the name? John. Um, House of the Rising Sun. House, exactly. But we've been avoiding copyright violations for a while now. I, I don't want to go back to that. Oh, we're already I, using copyright yeah, material. Yeah, yeah, yes, but said. for some reason YouTube does not <laughs> issue copyright claims for the score for Moonrise <laughs> Kingdom. Nice. Then maybe we'll choose just another Andre de Splat score. Josh, I, was, I, I debated uh, putting... Just some theme music for from Grand Budapest in at some point. Do that. All right, I'll. I'll I, I it's it's only safe. fitting. I'll see what I can throw together. 2014 is such a touchstone for this podcast <laughs> that it, it's only fitting. That's a good point. Because uh, today we're examining yet another movie from that fantastic year, 2014. <laughs> it was fantastic. It was a good year. It, it was, was a great it was a year. It, it year only looks me. better the further we get from yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, before Almost. we before well, we get too I far into this, but. before we get too far into this, uh, Warner once again could not make it today. So in, here in his stead, we have a guest <gasps> for the, the second ever time on the show. Who, who is this guest? Who was it the first time? It was Nate. Oh right, yeah, Nate. Uh, um, yeah, and that episode was uh, I think the longest one we've ever done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what we'll see... happens when you get three movie people? So <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see how this goes. And uh, a hack fraud. Today, uh, <laughs> my brother fraud. Alex is joining us. Hello. Why am I waving? They uh, can't see me. Yeah. <laughs> we constantly do things like that. I I did my screen. We had dance two on visual the final gags part. on the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> two. <laughs> and yet, audio. for some reason, I didn't call that episode. We can't use visual metaphors. It's the audio podcast for a visual world. Yeah. Hey, is <laughs> trademark. <laughs> trademark. <laughs> totally original. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this week is the 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 promised Damien Chazelle week. Uh, we have all now seen La La Land. Yes, and I have to show you something, Tyler. Okay. Two of us have seen it twice. Yes. Uh, so. So, for those of you who can't see, I have a uh, note slide in my notes called Fave Movies. The um, inexplicable among note them, page. Yes, among them is the Grand Budapest Hotel, Boogie Nights, <laughs> and more recently, La La Land. Oh, oh. goody. I, I would, I would have yeah. thought you would put Whiplash, because for this week we also examined uh, Damien Chazelle's uh, breakthrough film, Whiplash. <laughs> the, the film that put him on the map. Indeed. Um, but first, uh, I just want to briefly talk about this one thing, uh, to, to continue the theme of, of adaptation from mm -hmm. our, our show last week, because Ooh. this past week I, uh, I started reading, uh, A Game of Thrones, uh, the, the first book in the series upon which the, the television series Game of Thrones is based. Uh, <laughs> and? Well, look, I, I have an odd history with Game of Thrones because I, I watched the show, um, not live, but I, I watched every I watched every episode up through I think like the second episode of, of season five. Then I just stopped and and <laughs> never went back. But I've read the Wikipedia summaries. For every, <laughs> I, I need to be in the know for every subsequent episode. Like as season th season six was airing last year, I would I would 
read the summary the day after each episode so, aired. So you just didn't get lost, or so I, I don't know why I did that. I just I I liked reading about the episodes. I just didn't want to watch them. So the the natural conclusion I came to from that was, hey, maybe I should read the books. And I I will say I got more of a sense of Daenerys Targaryen's character from one chapter in <laughs> the book A Game of Thrones than I got from four seasons of the show A Game of Game of Thrones. Well, what is the adaptation? Here's the thing. I have never seen this show <laughs> nor these books. I'm a I am a cultural anomaly in yeah. that regard. Yeah. Well, what? I, well, I watched I, I watched up to like season three, then I just stopped. And I've seen like bits and pieces, and I've just looked at it and said. It's boring as pace. <laughs> I can probably sum it up in three words. Boobs and, s- and dragons. Boobs. Um, let's see. Well, well, here's the thing. Is there adaptation style like the all good things? We're just going to pull well, here and there and put it in a big pot? Or I mean, yes. Uh, it's so weird because the uh, I think their adaptation has gotten increasingly looser as the show has gone on. Good. To, to the point where season six like was mostly material that has not been in the books yet. Um, if only because the sixth book has not yet been released. Ooh, originality. Um, and, uh, well, the funny thing is um, they, they used two... They did one book per season for the first two seasons. Then they did... Season three and four were both one book. And then they did two books in one season, and then now they're in like completely uncharted territory. They're, they're, they're because a total fuckball zone. G- George R. R. Martin is notorious for being a, a very very slow and uh, late writer. Um, and, and good on him. Yeah, I guess. Um, but he he has two more books to write. Two more. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure he's going to die before <laughs> yeah. at least finishing the, sec- well, the seventh been, that one. That has been the trend. Uh, look, I, 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 he'll pro- he might finish the sixth one. I don't think he's going to finish the seventh one. Uh, but there it is. Anyway, the point is, um, <laughs> the, my, my, my whole quibble with Game of Thrones, first of all, it's just punishing viewing. Like, it, mm. it is such a miserable you know, downtrodden, downtreading show. War is in the distance. Uh, uh, just that in terms of, like, they, they you know, the, the whole big thing with the show is that they will kill anybody. But, like, once they kill... I think they've never re- quite recovered from from killing off um, Sean Bean's character in the first season, which, which occurs right. in the book, apparently. But, like... Once they did that, I'm not really sure they have a protagonist anymore, and that's been... Well, that's that's a, made it increasingly complicated to sustain a narrative. There is a reason most shows don't just... Ha- don't ha- have the moniker, we'll kill anyone, right. anytime. And then, like, in season four, there's a particularly harrowing death that almost put me off of the show completely, mm. and then, like, three episodes later, I was like, okay, I'm just done. Um... <laughs> And, and, I don't know, they're, so between that and the fact that, like, their structure is just so strange, and also, like, I could never see what the point of the show was. I think with books, like, world building and, like, narrative creation in its own sense works fine, because it's one guy, like, mm-hmm. pouring all his energy into creating this world. There's yeah, something, right. you know, very, I There's think... There's something f- Yeah, yeah. With a show, they're sinking hundreds of millions of dollars into into doing this. You know, they're employing you know thousands of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do. If you're going to do that, I think there has to be more of a point to it than yeah. look at this world. Isn't look at what pretty? we're doing. You know, uh, between the acting's good and the writing's pretty okay, and yeah. boobs. Um, <laughs> I just I just don't see the point of the show, and also I think it has kind of helped to end. Uh, the the era of the antihero on television, um, mm. which I'm not sure has been a great thing for TV, but the the book is pretty good so far. Like I, again, I'm I'm getting a lot more sense of character from it than the show ever gave me, and um, I don't know. It's fascinating to see like how George R. R. Martin's mind works in terms of constructing this thing. So I think yeah. To me, I look at it and said, I'd say. I can just read a history book. <laughs> I can just read real history. Any, yeah. if, if anything, it's more interesting yeah. than what these yeah. people try to make of it. I mean, you're not wrong. Like he, he took plenty of inspiration from uh, medieval history. Medieval. 
um, the, you know, you know the besides least interesting the dragons part of, <laughs> of world history. Controversial opinions abound. Well, yeah, whatever. I, I okay. look. I, I I've I've spent the last several months uh, uh, intermittently working on a rap song about my artistic issues with Game of Thrones. So <laughs> suffice it to say, I mean, uh, at least it's giving you something positive. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Other than the just like. Yeah, fuck you uh, approach that I'm giving it. I just don't know, man. I just I just don't see the point. It's, <laughs> whatever. Game of Thrones. We'll be crucified by our seven viewers. Lots of people like it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yes. Is that kind of our opening to what we've been watching? I don't know. I haven't been watching much. I uh, mm, instead of of watching things on our on our six hour. Oh well, what we've been watching is not so much a movie as. The greatest musical of the 21st Ooh. century, uh, Hamilton. Uh, yes, I was an enjoyable how, experience. How was, was it? Oh, it was, it was incredible. Uh, oh, yeah. Surprise, surprise! Hamilton's good. Uh, <laughs> Who knew? Yes. Um, my family the, over the past weekend went to took a trip to Chicago to see the the Chicago production of Hamilton. Um, good. Good. Uh, good. Yeah. Uh, very good. I'd I'd say well I haven't seen the the Broadway version but I'd say it's pretty much on par the the theater they're in is is pretty big and the set well, they've got downtown is downtown Chicago yeah or... yeah um the private bank theater it's called um anyway the, yeah no the set is uh pretty uh, on par with what I've seen that, that they've got on Broadway the actors mostly I think superb um okay. there were one or two weak links I don't want to get into that too much but but for the most part they they were great the the fellow playing Aaron Burr uh whose whose name oh, escapes yeah. me was, was uh, outstanding um yeah the guy uh, uh, along with um whoever played um Jefferson slash uh Marquis de Lafayette uh also outstanding apparently he's only a junior in college um oh. Oh, so oh, yeah. um, it was very interesting to see uh him and where he was he was excellent uh their hamilton was very very good um a, a better singer i think than than lin-manuel miranda if not mm. doesn't have quite the same level of enthusiasm but you know but, well, well, lin-manuel miranda there's just such a energy and yeah, passion right, that right. is very yeah, apparent was, like any time even if, even in interviews he's just <laughs> bursting at the seams yeah and this guy didn't quite have that but he i I think there's too much burden. There's too much, uh, uh, I don't know, emphasis ex placed on original casts. I yeah. think because mm. like, I think it's interesting to see someone else's take because well, yeah, the original that's... cast is going to be like enshrined in mm -hmm. the collective culture like forever. We have the original right. cast. They're recorded. Millions yeah. of people have right. seen them. They're they're there. I think so, it is really interesting to see people look at the same material and go. Right. What do I think about this? Yeah. So What's you my know, take? it was fascinating to watch like a different take on Aaron Burr, a different take on Alexander Hamilton, like someone taking this material and putting their own specific spin on it. That that to me was the most interesting part of it. And you know, the music is just kick ass. Uh, it's hey, Lin Manuel Miranda is a really cool guy. <laughs> I don't give a shit about Hamilton. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah, yeah, this has been an ongoing conflict I, between I, between John and me. I, 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 I don't. I haven't been really putting up a fight. I just acknowledge its existence and move <laughs> on. I don't. I don't care. I, I can't force you to care about it. <laughs> but regardless, um, to I, I did watch one movie. Um, over uh, I rewatched. Uh, this is. I've been in the recent months. I've been going through a lot of Miyazaki because I find mm. uh, it, they're it, they're great comfort films. And I rewatch. <laughs> this is hardly his best movie, but it's the one I find by far the most interesting. It's Howl's Moving Castle. Uh, uh, it's a mess. It's a mess. <laughs> There's no wow way to do, way to think about it. But God damn it, I love it. <laughs> I love every second of it. It does jump around. It jump. It, it feels like. An entire season of television crammed mm. into two hours. And that sounds awful, but the issue is, like, all the characters are so well drawn, you don't really care. Mm. And, like, it, it is just crammed full of, like, all these ideas, some of which are from the book he adapted for it, some of which are from Miyazaki himself. Like, there's this great big backdrop that turns into the climax, which is more or less steampunk World War One, which is <laughs> fascinating. Um, it's a very fact. It's all about facades and how, like the 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 originally she's the antagonist, but that changes throughout. Whereas, like she always looks like she's melting, <laughs> and like and, and one of the things they do to her is that they they 
pound with light and they strip away what she has uh, changed herself to look like. That's something I notice uh, this time watching it. Um, parts of it are the best thing that Miyazaki's made. Mm. Like, it is just, it is the most gorgeous thing you'll ever look at. It's the prettiest movie I think you would ever lay eyes on. The background work is just stunning. There's just, there's just so many moving pieces all the time. It's just stunning to look at. And, like, some of the scenes, I think, are the best thing that Miyazaki's made. But overall, it doesn't always cohese. It sometimes chaffs on itself. Like it said, there's just so much. It can't always... It just doesn't always work. But it's fascinating viewing, nonetheless. It has my key. <laughs> That's Porco Rosso. <laughs> Doesn't it this has a, Christian Bale doing his Batman, Batman oh, voice. Oh, Goody. Wrong Batman. Does is, it, does, is Liam Neeson in that? No, uh -huh. no. He's in Pon Ponyo. Oh, okay. 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 I haven't seen any of Miyazaki's films, and they're like high up on my list of movies to watch, especially uh, Spirited Away. Spirited and, Away. Uh, uh, my Neighbor Totoro. I, I'd find something, like, if anything, I think like a good starter movie is... You, Spirited Away is one people start on. I don't think anyone's been failed by Spirited Away. I love I love Spirited Away. I've I've only seen it once, but it, mm. it's quite extraordinary. If you want something a bit more tropey, a bit more Western, Castle in the Sky is a shitload of fun. <laughs> yeah, I and um, it has Mark Hamill as the villain. Oh, Doing boy. his Joker voice. <laughs> <so much. laughs> um, yeah, no, Spirited Away is such a strange movie. It's yeah. it's such like a it's almost dreamlike. I think which is. Probably the point. How's Moving Castle is similar, but mm. like it, 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 it has more of a plot. Like, like mm. Spirited Away is like really aimless. Like, there's yeah. kind of a ticking plot, but kind of just moves on here. Mm. How's Moving Castle? They tried to have a ticking clock, but even then, it's still kind of aimless, and they just go from set piece to set piece. Sometimes it's literally just they just have the main character sitting by the seaside, mm. uh, sitting amongst the steampunk world they built. Well, it's funny because I was just thinking yesterday uh, that I might, like, go on a Miyazaki binge uh, the, for over the next semester, just because yeah. I've I've enjoyed what I've seen of mm -hmm. his, and I really want it. And I was like, for some reason I was reading about Princess Mononoke just, like, oh. on a whim, and mm -hmm. apparently that movie's, like, over two hours long, this, yeah, like, big, it's epic, his, oh, it's his Kurosawa PG-13 rated thing. I think it's, they're showing that at, uh, at um, one of the movie theaters around here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think, yeah. like, the, the Gateway does, like, their big Miyazaki um, binge mm. every once in a while. Like, Princess oh, yeah, they Mononoke, have that going on Princess right Mononoke is, like, a Kurosawa movie, mm. but animated by Miyazaki. Oh, no, I think of what it was, like, Marcus is showing it, because, uh, it's, like, a yeah. 20th anniversary oh, yeah, screening. Right. Um, that's before, maybe we should go to that. Mononoke, um, yeah, Mononoke's fascinating. I'd be, I haven't seen that. That's one that's sort of on the lower end of my list mm. for some, I don't know, I think I just love I love Miyazaki's steampunk world so much, and to see him going to Kurosawa land, I think, eh. <laughs> But, like, that's a fascinating one. I don't know, I think, I really want to do Howl's Moving Castle for the podcast, because I just find it so fascinating. We've been thinking of doing that since the first episode. Since, yes. Like, that movie's just so, is it his best one? I don't think so. But it has elements of his best movie, mm -hmm. of his best work. But I think it's just so fascinating. It's just so full. Of it's it's just so full of ideas. I can't mm -hmm. help but just rattle on about. Like any time I watch, it, I just go into this week where I just can't stop thinking about <laughs> it. And it's the prettiest thing you'll ever yeah. see. So I might even just go on a Studio Ghibli binge because I I want to watch Only Yesterday only because yes. and that that's a Takahata film. I yeah, think. I've seen very few of the non Miyazaki Hayao Miyazaki mm. directed. Uh, well, I have no interest films. in like the secret world of Arietti or anything like <laughs> I, no, that. I, I've seen I've seen Arietti. Arietti's cute. Okay, um, like, the, the rest of them they're like it, Miyazaki is such is one of the greatest filmmakers mm. of all time, and to see people other people within that studio take on similar material. Mm. But they can never live up to the yeah. master. There's some fascinating well, power. Just because, based based on what I've read, like Takahata is like the other major auteur of, of Studio Ghibli, and he's no Miyazaki. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. Like Grave of the Fireflies sounds fascinating, and uh, some of his other stuff. I don't know. I'm kind of curious about the tale of the Princess Cayuga or whatever. Kayuk. Like, uh, whatever that I, movie I, is. I've heard sort of mixed things. I have. I. I, sh I, I the, that one interests me, but mm -hmm. I haven't really gotten around. To it, I don't know. We could just do like a Ghibli month at some point. A Ghibli month, good lord! Wow. <laughs> a Ghibli month. We'd be the Studio Ghibli podcast. There are worse things to be. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, there are a lot of podcasts that like devote themselves to one thing. Yeah. We are kind I, of in the. You know, there are episodes. There are podcasts like devoted exclusively to The West Wing. I yeah. would be uh, interested in maybe like doing a, a Breaking Bad rewatch podcast because that. that 
That show, that's kind of the only other thing I've been watching, because AMC had daily marathons, <laughs> mm. and I was just going through and rewatching a bunch of episodes. Yeah, I wouldn't be against that. It's I, great. I, I, it finally I forced that. me to sit down and watch that show. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's get to the uh, event of the month, perhaps? We've been we've been promising this for a while. Maybe um, a year. Yeah. This um, is, yeah, for 2016. This this is the 2016 Swang Song episode. Uh, yes, let's talk uh Damien Chazelle. Uh Ooh, the the new popular auteur. He he a really bit is. A monster, but yeah. Is he? I kind of like him. We'll get, we'll get into that. We don't know if he's a monster, necessarily. And it, there's some interesting things with Whiplash going on <laughs> that we'll get to. Um, yeah. So anyway, Damien Giselle, uh, a real kind of up-and-comer. Um, mm-hmm. Whiplash was his big breakthrough. Um, nominated for several Oscars. Yep. Won a few. Uh, J.K. Simmons won one for his astounding performance. Yep. Uh, he, they, he just burst out of the gate and... Now, La La Land is getting lots of talks of awards, and all that the people mm-hmm. involved in that are... Yep. Yeah. I, I don't think it's a, a controversial statement to say that this movie will probably win Best Picture. Uh, that's all right. I, I think it'll be... It's likely. What I, I am curious what are the race politics of Moonlight will mm. push it over the edge. That's I, interesting. That'd I, be an interesting thing to see. I would be very okay with either of these movies winning. Mm. Um, I still need to see Moonlight. <laughs> <laughs> Moonlight's just an extraordinary movie, but... Um, this movie is too, I think, um, for for very different reasons. Oh, yes. uh, what do we want to talk about first? Uh, let's get. To, I think Whiplash is the one we should talk about first because <laughs> yeah. I don't. Uh, that one, yeah. I, I think I kind of want to end on. Well, here's. Do we want to do kind of a conversation about 2016 at the end of this, or? Well, we can do okay. a little bit. I was debating whether we would do like a best movies of 2016 like episode. A draft or... Not necessarily a draft, or like. I was just like, maybe just run down our personal, like, mm-hmm. top fives or something. If I fucking have a top five. Uh, I was going to say, but, like, you and guys don't see as many movies as I do. No. Um, like, the yeah. movies I see are, like, it was it was a case, like, last semester I was watching pretty much four movies a week. It'd be two or three for class, and then two for the, two for the podcast. Mm-hmm. So the, that's, like, <laughs> if, if it was a new release, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Let's let's do a quick wrap up of 2016 yeah. at the end. Um, Whiplash, the, the the movie that put him on the map. 2014's uh, what a the year? Seminal year. We, we've Seminal. talked a lot. I think that that's like our defining year because yeah. that's the first year that we were all like really into movies, and mm-hmm. that's the year our kind of our little podcast group here kind of yeah, that's, together. Yeah, like I remember, I think like the the formation of that was like the dual screening of Birdman and Interstellar. Yeah. That we, um, got, that we put together. And then, um, I think us like standing in line for a ride at Cedar Point <laughs> debating whether Birdman or Boyhood was a, a, a uh, oh, yes. greater film. Uh, uh, um, Birdman still wins, but... Uh, okay, well, <laughs> fuck you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the seminal year. We keep talking yeah, about we, it. We, yes. Um, so we've gone on record as saying we think Grand Budapest Hotel is the best movie of, of 2014. Mm, at the uh, very least, by far the most watchable. I keep forgetting about Whiplash, to be honest, but every time I watch this movie, I am, again, kind of blown away by it. With La La Land on the map, it's now kind of be it's being viewed as, like, part of the opening arc of well, Baby and yeah. Giselle, I, I and think it's less being discussed as a 2014 I think movie. the situation here is going to be a lot like what happened with, with Tarantino when Pulp Fiction came out, which mm-hmm. is that, like... Like, Pulp Fiction was such a phenomenon that yeah. it made people, like, go back and rewatch Reservoir Dogs and be like, yeah. oh, this this is fucking great. Yeah. yeah. I think that'll happen now that La La Land is getting mm-hmm. so much attention with, with Whiplash. Even though Whiplash, I think, got a lot Whiplash of attention. Whiplash got quite a bit. Like, J.K. Simmons won for yeah, it. Yeah. Um, it, it got a bunch of high. Several people said it was the best movie of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember I went to see that movie um, at some point in January or February around Oscar season. Um, and I was just on the edge of my seat the oh whole time. I, I was so absorbed by it. Damien Chazelle has, has a way with pace and, and like, all of his movies feel like this. You, you're just strapped in and you are just along for the ride. You, yeah. It just bang, bang, bang. The camera's always moving. Like there is, it just, Fascinating situation after fascinating situation. Yeah. He's a really interesting filmmaker to watch. Yeah, so um, Whiplash uh, follows uh, Miles Teller as Andrew Naiman. 
Uh, and uh, J.K. And, Simmons as and, Terrence yes, Fletcher. J.K. Simmons as Terrence monster. Fletcher. Who, <laughs> who the fuck comes up with these movie names? <laughs> they they form a... Um, uh, so Miles, Miles Teller's character is a, a, a an, an aspiring jazz drummer mm. at uh, Schaefer Conservatory, uh, yep. clearly, I think, based on Juilliard. Yes. Um, J.K. Simmons, as uh, Terrence Fletcher, recruits him for uh, like, the, like the, the, top the band, elite yeah. Yeah, jazz band and quickly reveals himself to be just a, a, a fucking monster. monster. A monster. A monster. Yeah. But his whole thing is that, like, he, he gives this big speech about how Charlie Parker became, like, the mm. best musician of, of, you know, his time because Joe Jones threw a symbol at his head. A, a, a very human monster. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. He, like, J.K. Simmons' whole thing, or Terrence Fletcher's whole thing, whatever, <laughs> uh, is uh, that he is trying to push... Mm. Um, Miles Teller to to realize his his full potential as yeah. a musician. To, to quote him, the two worst words in the English language are "good job." Right. Yeah. And so, so it's it's <laughs> fascinating to kind of look at this and see. You know, I think the big thing with this movie is like, you know, how far is too far? At yes. what point do you stop? You know, yeah. encouraging greatness or mm -hmm. pushing someone towards greatness and just start being, you know. Horribly abusive and, and what is the line between passion and obsession? Mm -hmm. Which I think is a line that what because it's not the it's not the case where it's like oh like Miles Teller just really wants this. He has literally yeah. devoted every waking second <laughs> of his life right. to getting a fucking yes. drum. And, solo Andrew right. is is a um, just an obsessive uh, mm -hmm. drum player, and and that obsession is only spurred. Yeah. By, um, it, it's just a fascinating movie about, I think, the nature of obsession and how, yes. like, it really drives people mm -hmm. toward on, on self destructive, uh, like, arts. I like, like the scenes where, like, he is drumming and, like, he is literally bleeding yeah. as he yeah. is doing this, it is literally tearing him apart, or even he gets into a car accident but then still goes on stage and performs, right? That's until mm -hmm. you know, the, the big kind of turning point of this movie, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is when he's, like, just smack, hit by a truck. And he's, yeah, he, he gets in a horrific car accident, and his first talk isn't, I need an ambulance, it's, fuck, the <laughs> performance. Yeah. And he goes up, and he literally cannot drum. Yeah. But he tries his damnedest anyway. Yeah. Um, and, by the way, uh, I have to say, you know what that car crash probably gave him? Whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Ah! I'm so sorry. Um, anyway, but, um, so I just have to say this. Um, I admire this movie quite mm -hmm. a lot. The, the filmmaking in it is spectacular. Damien Chazelle is, I think, m maybe knows more than anyone else how to shoot a musical performance. Yeah, he really gets the physicality of it. Yeah. It, it, it's more yeah. than just like, oh, just put the camera back, let's do some choreography. Mm -hmm. There is a real tangible sense of... These people have worked on this for years, yeah. and here it is, and here's yeah. all the, like, I, I think of, like, the scene where they're looking at the jazz performance in La La Land, they're just like, look, there he's hijacking the song, and now there right. he's going, he really loves the the mechanics of music, and that, yeah. that's very clear, it's like, he shows, like, every piece of this band is kind of a, yeah. an independent working cog. Yeah, and, like... Just you know, uh, this movie deservedly, I think, won the Oscar for for best editing, oh, and yes. and uh, just wow, like some those, of the montages, those sequences, and like the shot selection, and just uh, okay, like as someone who has worked on movies, I cannot even imagine like what it must have been like. They had to choose to get that extreme close up of the sheet music. They had to yes. choose to get that shot of the trumpet blowing directly into the camera. Like yeah. all these shots are things mm -hmm. they had to plan. They had really to say, hey, specific. We yeah. want this shot, and oh my god! Like how I don't uh, truthfully, I don't, I don't even know how they would have decided how, all of that. Well, Damien Chazelle just has a great eye. Like this film was gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, like like the fucking image of like we have. Where like the camera starts and it right and it kind of rise. I think we have the camera moves up or down and yeah. like, the lights and the crowd are revealed behind Miles Teller, mm -hmm. who is just completely in silhouette. That is just a wonderful image, and I yeah. can't imagine anyone else getting that shot. Damien Chazelle, like as we'll see with when we talk about La Land, has a a very clear style. Oh yeah, he mm -hmm. he's got a fucking vision. Like yeah. he he knows what he wants. Yeah. Um. So that's all great. Um. All that being said. This I admire this movie. I admire the hell out of this movie. 
this is a hard movie for me to love. I it's think. uncomfortable. And it is, uncomfortable. it is legitimately uncomfortable to watch at times. Yeah. It's... And and um actually my good friend Brady, this is his favorite movie of all time. And huh. um he points out like it's exactly like what it needs to be. And he's right. Like this is a it's very, very it's very it's pared a, down. Yeah, it's a very yeah. efficient movie. Like I would mm-hmm. notice this more like this time through. Like every scene like simultaneously advances the plot while also showing you like character, character depth. Yeah. Um, it's, he, he seems to be very work uh, despite having like a very clear vision he also seems very workman like it's like alright we get this we get this we get that we, mm. this is all we need go I, 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 I hesitate to call him like workman like but I, I think like um I, I don't know. I think it's a it's a great screenplay, but uh, mm-hmm. it's just interesting, like how efficient it is. It, it is, yeah, it is. But anyway, um, like a lot of this movie is done through montage. That times. is that is true. Um, I don't know that those montages are very engaging. Oh though. yes. Um, just the thing is, th- both Andrew and Fletcher like reveal themselves to be such unlikable characters. Yes. What, that's a yes. really interesting arc, and in I find is that what we throughout the course of the movie. Miles Teller is becoming Fletcher. Mm-hmm. Like, he is gaining this, that this is my work. I will do everything in my path to, well, to he's enrich becoming, my he, He's my more or less project. becoming, like, a shadow or, like, a cog in Fletcher's... A, a, a kind of, and especially he, at the end, that's... Because mainly Fletcher's goal is to basically create another Charlie Parker. Right. Like, that's been Well, his, Reed, I agree more goal. with you. I wouldn't say he's becoming Fletcher necessarily, mm-hmm. but he's... Falling under Fletcher's spell yeah. in a way, I think. Uh, yeah. And I mean, to me, my thing about that is that at the end, that the big bravado moment at the end is him literally stealing mm. his that show from Fletcher and becoming the conductor via the drum. Yeah. Well, well, a little. I think that's more out of saying you fucked me over. I'm gonna fuck yeah. you. Well, over. That, that, that's yeah. what motivates it. I, I'll talk about the ending more in a second because the ending is, I think, one of the most fascinating things about this movie. So, yeah. But I read a little bit of the screenplay. There's a lot of like his relationship with his dad that was kind of, I think, cut from cut the movie. To the side, yeah. Um, and like he, uh, I think it's clear, like from the beginning, like he is disappointed in what like his dad's life has become. He, he's apathetic towards his father. Yeah, and and like he, you know, that scene at the dinner table, like where he, you know, remarks like, "I'd rather like die drunk at like thirty two and have people at a dinner table talk about me than you know die sober at ninety and have mm-hmm. no one know who I, who I was." Like he is like obsessive about like becoming like mm-hmm. quote-unquote great or like one of the greats great, and, like, and like being remembered at any cost yeah and like he you know shows himself to be so willing to like you know hurt both himself and other people to do mm-hmm. that like it's it's so hard to root for anyone in this yeah. movie like the, the cold clinical scene of him just telling his girlfriend hey i can't do this anymore I got a drum. Mm. And they sound like, yeah, you have no direction in your life. This is something I have to do. And you'll just get in the way. Oh, I see. You understand. Okay. But but I think it's important to make the distinction. I don't think Damien Chazelle is endorsing that. No. No. Um, and, well, jo, you you guys were saying earlier, like, you think he, maybe he's a bit of a monster. Like, what what exactly do you mean there? Because I, I don't think he's endorsing Fletcher's philosophy. I don't no. think he's endorsing like Andrew's kind of mm-hmm. obsessiveness. Like, I think he's showing you like, Hey, like this, this is, is this are. is extremely dangerous. Oh, I he, think I, he, he doesn't, may... he doesn't deny like the, the danger element for me. What that comes through the ending, which seems to be like, man, they're monsters, but that drum solo is really <laughs> fucking cool. <laughs> And it's like, like well, look what okay. they're doing. Look what they're making here. And I'm like, yo, oh, that's not what you should be ending on when you're making, when you are creating a, a depiction of cautionary monsters. Well, Reed, what, what, give me your perspective and I'll throw in my two cents here. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so I guess where I was sort of cut off was that what maybe Damien Chazelle is trying to say with this movie is maybe that there is a fine line but it's with me, uh, mediocrity of of sorts and then and then superiority mm. and then nothing but less but then saying that there are costs obviously mm. with trying to reach superiority as you go well john i think the thing with the with the drum solo at the end was i mean a like you know i think it's partially a reflection of of the characters because like both fletcher and andrew are like oh this drum solo was awesome yeah. also like you can separate like great music from you know the 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 people, the people that it. I 
enjoy Ride of the Valkyries. Obviously, Richard <laughs> Wagner was a horrible human being. Yeah. But, uh, look, I, I mean, I, I kind of get what you're saying, mm-hmm. but I, I think it's it's maybe also partially to create, like, some form of, of ambiguity a little bit. Oh, yes, that's, I'm not going to deny, like, it's, I'm not going to say that's, like, the only interpretation that, like, he, that he's endorsing this yeah. at the end. Like, he, I think there's a... The way it just abruptly ends yeah. just leaves so much to be the, right. so many so many questions. I mean that, and I think that has to be by design. But yeah. that, that, that's oh, my yes. that's my other major quibble with this movie. Um, like I'm not a huge fan of, of ambiguous endings. I don't think any of us are really. To some extent, maybe this was. I mean, mostly this was ambiguous. But there's one point where finally at the end. Andrew and Fletcher are sort of on the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that Andrew more or less sees Fletcher's philosophy, Mm -hmm. perhaps, in some way. I mean, not fully outright. But then, yes, there is ambiguity of, oh, what happens next? And it's sort of like, oh, it doesn't matter. But it's like, should it matter? But, I don't know. I I, I do like him. Um, ambiguous endings it's, it's like as long as you do like all the things you need to do like in a concrete three three act structure movie mm-hmm. which is like develop characters give to yeah parts, that, that's and, a fair point but to, and if, if you leave on the question of what was what they were doing the right thing or something like that that's i love that yeah okay i mean well the other reason like i um you know i find it difficult to like love this movie is I think it has, like, one of the most depressing, cynical endings yes. in the history of film. And one of the most depressing, cynical uh, because, views of its world. Because I don't think, like, the, I think, you know, the other, like, big question is, like, who wins in the yeah. end? I think any way you slice it, there's no way Andrew wins this thing. No, like, it's I, Fletcher. I, yeah, like, yeah. Fle- Fletcher wins either way, because either... Andrew, like, is totally under Fletcher's control now. Like, that, mm-hmm. that look at the end where, like, he looks up at Fletcher, Fletcher, like, gives him, like, a nod of approval. Like, everything and Andrew he is smiles. Doing is at the approval yes. of Fletcher. And so either you have that, or Andrew has, like, finally, like, impressed Fletcher enough to gain his approval. Mm. But if that's true, <laughs> Andrew needs Fletcher's approval yeah. to know that he's doing it well. Yes. It's like, and that is just heartbreaking there is especially considering that there's a, an entire scene right after the death of one of Fletcher's students where he and the two yeah. other drummers basically duke it out from nine o'clock to two in the morning on yeah. who gets it on who gets the uh drum kit part it's yeah that is a with double time swing I, I don't think it endorses these people but I, I, do, I would I, say certainly not. I think it, it I think it tolerates them just a little bit too much because I think like Mm-hmm. Fletcher's stance is portrayed. Like I remember reading, it, it, Rod Treber died by this point, but there was a review on his website. I can't remember who wrote it, but and he was like, he he wanted this big dirge about like participation medals. Yeah, in that review. well, that's yeah, that's kind of the other big thing with this. Bigger thing, and it's like, it's like, oh, you don't get it. Like this is this sh- to to not see this as like the most horrifying thing. Just this world of you. Like, when Fletcher conducts his band, whenever he criticizes someone, he says, you are um, sabotaging my performance. This mm-hmm. is my band. Everything he does is for himself. Yeah. Which reminds me of my former band director. But <laughs> let's not go into that. And, like, and this philosophy he builds is that, like, yeah. there is no room for positive reinforcement. Mm. There's, like, good, there, you can never tell someone they are doing good. They will just be constantly left in this spiral of, yeah. what the fuck am I well, doing? Well, I know a lot of people who are, like, who would, like, say that, like, we live in the era of, like, participation mm-hmm. trophies and, like, you know, they don't want to, like just tell kids they're doing a good job, like, yeah. just to raise their self-esteem. Uh, like, criticism is essential. Yeah, yes. and sure. But at the same time, like, uh, and and I think you're right, John, like, I think Fletcher goes beyond that. Like, yeah. he, he says, like, that's what he's doing, mm-hmm. but you're totally right. Like, like he, It's all for him. Yeah, he, he says, like, I never had a Charlie Parker. He wants to be the one to mm-hmm. find the next Charlie Parker. He that's, wants to that's see that's his name in the about. paper and have him say, look at this great guy who got all these kids yeah. into the because right part. Of I the... made that. Yes. yes. I think you're absolutely right about that. And what definitely sets him apart, um, and what I think truly is, is the final straw of him becoming a monster for himself, is that the day after Schaefer gets first place in the first competition, hmm. he just says nothing about hey good job guys right. he says let's get to work yeah um 
And well, John, but I, I think that's what like keeps this movie from like being just like a, a horrifying like well, yeah, monstrosity. I mean, like no, that it, that aspect of it like shows you that like Damien Chazelle knows mm-hmm. that like this however however kind of right this guy might be, he has much more mm-hmm. selfish and terrible motives behind this. Yeah, like, well, granted, my criticisms of toleration are just all in the ending, where mm. it does just seem to end on, isn't this cool, guys? <laughs> that, that's, like, my only huge uh, bleak, but uh, this movie's brilliant. Yeah. I, 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 I will never deny that. Like, it's, it might be the best movie of 2014. Grand Budapest <laughs> is by far the most watchable thing that came out of that year, mm. but I think that as a crafted piece of cinema, this mm. might be the best thing to come out of what was a really good year. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on, uh, finally, uh, to... <laughs> hey, what flash is interesting? Uh, 2016's La La Land. Ooh. Um, I've now uh, seen this movie twice. Uh, As uh, have I. Yes. Uh, I have it. Just once. I saw it once. So, let's dive into uh, the best movie of 2016, <laughs> according to Pretty other people, not yes. me. Um, yeah. What do you think, guys? Um, <laughs> um, best movie of 2016. <laughs> uh, best movie I've seen. Of 2016. That, yeah, yeah. yeah. Best, best um, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I put it at, like, number three, I, I think. Okay. Like, the, the, the first time I sat down to, to see it, I was like, okay, like, best movie of 2016. Yeah. Like, let's see what you got. So, uh, so I was, like, kind of, like, feeling a little bit, like, contrarian the whole mm-hmm. time. Um, mm-hmm. But I was, like, quite on board with it by the end. Mm-hmm. The second time I saw it, I was just much more able to kind of, like, sit back and let just the music it. and the fun mm-hmm. just take me away. The first time I watched it, I had this kind of, like, wow, the technicals are just mind-blowing. Like, mm. the, the fucking opening, which is, like, we start in 4 by 3 and we right. rush <laughs> out and it fills yeah, the whole screen. <laughs> and then we have mm. where they're all dancing on, on the yeah. L.A. exit ramp. Like, mm. that's all just Flooring and like all through the technicals, mm. I, I think I remember that like, there's this bravado moment where like they're like M- Emma Stone and all these others, they go to this big Hollywood mansion party, and there's a point where they go into the pool mm. and they swim around and the can- and water's flat flashing up and people are jumping in and then you fireworks. I just have to say uh, it's interesting that uh, between Whiplash and La La Land, we've watched two movies this week that have a connection to Boogie Nights. Yes, uh, two weeks in a row we've watched a movie where. Um, Someone is threatened by the arrival of a of a new uh, person into their respective business, and then another movie where um, a, a camera goes underwater and and the music kicks in. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, regardless, yeah. Uh, yeah, like the tentacles are just all wonderful. Like the scene where like the, like the fucking big ending moment where they're running through like these old Hollywood looking sets. Yeah, yeah. Like that's yeah. so wonderful. The music's great. The ending montage is maybe my favorite part of this movie. Oh, it's it's, just, it's, it's a high heart. Heart. It pulls the heart. <laughs> it really does. I know. Yeah, it well, drags it. Once I got the technicals out of my system, and once I just really sat down, like, okay, what is this movie? I found like oh, this is a lot more tropey than I remember it being it, the first time. It's pretty. It's pretty simple. It, this pretty. It, it's no whip. But there's a lot less so simple to enjoy. I, well, the first time I watched I'm like wow there's a lot about music and how uh, and how that impacts people and like how mm. uh, careers impact people's lives and the second time I was like no there's not as nearly as much as that as I remember the first time it's a fairly straight romantic comedy yeah uh, well and, which which is which is fine because Emma Stone and uh, Ryan Gosling have great chemistry mm. so there's nothing wrong but I remember thinking like it's, I, I, <laughs> I was well, disappointed by the same movie. Yeah, the well, second well, time it, it was. It's inexplicable. Okay. Well, here here's my read on it. I am very rarely inclined to give movies points for like their ambition or like what mm. they're trying to do. Yeah. With this movie, I don't know why, but I really am actually mm-hmm. like I am totally like can see like he's trying to make like an old fashioned, mm-hmm. bright yes. colored oh, yeah. Hollywood musical. You know, um, th- that's just big and colorful and fun and just takes you away. Yeah. Um, and he really tries his damnedest to make a movie like that. And, yeah. you know, he gets... And, he and succeeds. And, yeah, yeah. and yeah. succeeds at doing that and also making it a, a modern story. Yeah. And yeah. I give the movie major points for that because I really just enjoyed that aspect of it. I yeah. will say... Um, this bothered me less on the second go round, but it, it it is still worth noting. 
you know, the whole big thing with this movie is like, it's a musical. Mm -hmm. And then for a long stretch in the middle, it's not. No. Oh, that is true. And I noticed this, like, Like, there are like three songs in the whole thing that just mix over and over again. The first time I didn't notice it, but now I'm like, oh God. Like the City of Stars theme, whatever, whatever Sebastian played. Because there's like, because there's like four like big songs in the first like 45 minutes. And then for like the next hour, there's like two. And, and, and yeah, it just stops for like a long, solid stretch, and it's kind of it's pretty consistent. But well, I mean, I don't know. I felt like there was just a much higher like average of, of songs in the in the in the open yeah. in the first act than there were in the, in the second and third. I know. It also felt like just on a pure plot and structural level, it just felt really jumpy. It feels like we're just like leaping well. from from moment to moment. Like it, it's the kind of movie that's like, well, we'll let your emotions. Uh, guide the story and the first time that really worked but looking at it a second time it's like oh this is kind of just a mess like we're kind of just oh just like, I, I, I don't, don't, I don't I, think so I, I don't think so especially because we know. use seasonal time cards well yeah, I, cards. I, I am also uh, not an emotional man uh, <laughs> uh, but I really was just swept up yeah. by it I think this the, letting the emotions drive the story mm-hmm. actually really works uh, yeah and, you know, you can say what you want. I mean, okay, yes, it's a it's a fairly rote, you know, rom-com plot. Uh, for the most part, you know, the, they... The ending is is unique, but the issue of that, because of that whole, like, ending song montage bit at the end, you still get that rom-com ending. Oh, you feel like that's, like, the best of both worlds, yeah, or that's, that's cheating that, in a way. That, it is kind of... It's great to watch in the moment, but it is kind of cheating from, like, a pure plot okay. standpoint. Yeah. I can see that point, but also... No, I think no. you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I, like that, that, that whole thing. So this movie like ends with like a big like you know Hollywood musical like wordless kind of montage mm-hmm. like of the kind that they had in like an American in Paris and Singing yeah. in the Rain and whatever, and it shows you like kind of an idealized version of, of Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone's relationship. Um, yeah. Might have been. Yeah. Um, like, um, no, to me that is just heartbreaking. Like that, it, to, to to watch that, that and then to go back and like they just you know both times. Uh, there have been audible gasps and groans <laughs> in the theater when, like, she comes back into the house and it's yeah. not Ryan Gosling mm-hmm. there. And, like, um, just her sitting with her husband and, like, them just looking at each other. Like, once that montage ends, you just, they look at each other, like, they exchange a nod and she just leaves. Oh, like, that and, moment's great. Like, and, that moment where they just kind of look at each other, like, acknowledge each other, yeah. and they're like, that's it. I mean, that's great. I guess I see your point, like, maybe this is kind of cheating a little bit, but... I also think it it really makes that last moment hit home all the harder yeah. when you see yeah. what they could have had. Yes, I know. It, to me, it kind of has like the guy Richie thing of let's cut to what we've already seen before, but like <laughs> like a couple of things added. I don't know. It's I, I, it, it I just know. It, it, for whatever reason it, it totally it, worked for me. The, 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 yeah. for, once I got the tentacles out of my system, but the tentacles are gorgeous. I can't say more. Like the fucking scene with Ryan Gosling on the boardwalk mm-hmm. and like just the purple it's sky around. Like, yeah. that's just one of the prettiest images Best of this shot year. Of 2016. <laughs> that's just one of the prettiest. Best scene in 2016. But I just remember, like, kind of slinking it out. It's like, it is, it's kind of, kind of what you were saying about Amelie, where it's like, it's, it's all this candy and all this, like, colorful mm. nonsense up on the screen. It's all delicious, but, like, there's nothing behind all it. Right. All right, fair. Fair. I just liked the candy a lot more. <laughs> I, do, I yeah. like the candy as well. Like, I, this is a film that thrives off of, uh, contrast mm-hmm. and juxtaposition, which oh, is yes, something yes. I love, uh, especially like the the scene where the um, after the party, where the it goes up to the the camera pans up to the the fireworks in the sky and then immediately cuts to no parking zone, and then yeah. right after that the huge singing in the rain esque tap number followed by <laughs> her phone ringing with the you know the apple. Yeah. And then uh, even like the opening scene, like this beautiful one take musical number followed by quick cuts of coffee going into yes. blouse. And it's and all coffee just, going on to blouse. It's in <laughs> the contrast is in everything. Yeah, I think like uh, Damien Chazelle's work with montage is kind of fascinating. That's <laughs> yeah. that's something to look at it going forward. I don't know. I, the first time I watched it, I, I was just I, I loved the candy. I lo- I was just I, it was just a ride from start to finish. But like I came back and I said, okay, what's really the meat of this? Mm-hmm. What's really behind this? And I found very little, mm-hmm. and that was really disheartening to me in, in a way that I just cannot discredit. 
I mean, I do think this movie's a lot less thematically rich than, than say, Whiplash. Yes. Or without yeah. an out. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. I, I, I just, I, I well, seem to... I, I hate myself as I say this. You must realize, <laughs> like, the, mo- like, the moment I got out of this, I just went, oh, God, I don't like this movie as much anymore. That was just heartbreaking for me. Mm. Well, read what do you think? If you had to pick the more interesting... Personally, I like La La Land a lot better than Whiplash. Okay. But I th- still think that... You know, Law La- La Land's not complex at all. It's fairly simple. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. while while Whiplash, there's a lot going on. So Ergo, that might be the more interesting movie. Sure. But but like appealing wise, La La Land was a bit more appealing mainly because mm-hmm. of the colors. And but like, it's already one of your favorite movies. Like why why is that? Is it just because the candy is just so fucking delicious? <laughs> the candy is so fucking delicious. <laughs> I will say this, um, brief tangent and nitpick. Um, the and, scene... it's all, and it's, and like the cinematography is sort of how I vision, I see the world also. Mm. So oh, yeah, it's good. that kinship. Um, the little floating dance number in the Griffith Observatory looks awful. <laughs> like the effects oh. look terrible. <laughs> but that's, that's like one moment. But it's, but it's kind of hilarious. <laughs> oh, you laughed your fucking ass <laughs> off. It's like, Rubbery Ryan Gosling and Rubbery Emma Stone, like, leap to the rods. Uh, it's hilariously uh, brand. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> but so that, that's a nitpick. That's not. I don't know. I think, the, again, like, what that sequence represents, I think, mm-hmm. is a lot. The more. music's great. Yeah. The yeah. music's great. The songs, I really like the songs in this. They're all, like, very jazz-infused. Mm-hmm. and They're all modern, too. They are all like, pretty modern. The fucking opening song, and then they use, like, da 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 That was yeah. your fucking head for weeks. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, the thing about using, like, four or five only, like, distinct melodies mm-hmm. is that it has, like, a, a stylistic consistency and a through yeah. line. Yeah. That, mm-hmm. Which is like, nice. A lot, of, yeah. a lot of even, like, Disney musicals lack. Yeah. Especially, uh... Uh, you know, Frozen. And well, it is a movie that actually uses its mu- mu- music to tell a story. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, look at this well, cool yeah. number. Look at all this cool special. dancing. Well, what's interesting about it is that, like, you know, he this movie is, like, explicitly harkening back to, like, you know, big studio musicals from, mm-hmm. like, the 50s. Right. Those right. musicals were always, mo- many of them just, like, plugged songs in yeah. that, like, had right. not been written for the movie. Like, Singing in the Rain, like, is all songs that had been previously written. Mm-hmm. They're just, like, songs for their own sake they're like like, we're gonna stop the movie and have them like gene kelly just sing and dance for a little bit the joy of singing in the rain is not oh look at this really deep thematic story it's look at even though that even though that movie also does have a pretty interesting thematic story oh yes but like that movie gets to have it both ways like like, look at gene uh, Gene kelly dancing look at this cool little sound yeah and 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 then with la la land it's like every musical number like is about the characters or about the story which is very interesting, I think. Except for the opening, but that's just really cool. Candy, well, yeah, so. yeah. Um, I'll, I'll take it. So, and then, it's like... It's nice intro set. It, 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 it yeah. sets the tone. Um, and then, like, Emma Stone's audition song at the end is mm-hmm. just... Oh, I love it. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. It you know, she, full, she's, uh, she's maybe not the best singer in the world, yeah. but... Well, she we, fucking we, sells. Yeah, b- yeah, both of them, yeah. like, just sell everything. And I think their yeah, dance I'd numbers are Emma great. Stone, I'd say Emma Stone's better. Do you think so? Most people seem to be leaning the other way. I, I, I think Emma Stone's Emma Stone's better. selling it more. Like, like there is just a, a lot Definitely more emotion on Emma Stone's I, I face know. at any given moment. You know, just to, to kind of just sum it all up, like, the the big thing I took away from this is, like, Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone are, are goddamn movie stars. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, oh, they're yeah. just joys to watch. Um, in this just shit heap of a year uh, i think yeah, we'll take anything. i think you know to have such a delicious like candy <laughs> colored like, just yeah. feel good just it, it, it's so gorgeous you know it's so gorgeous and, you know yeah. in most years yeah that wouldn't cut it for me mm-hmm. and like uh i was even thinking that like after i'd seen this movie the first time like i was like uh eh, you know okay like Okay, it's a feel good movie. Like mm-hmm. sometimes I don't like to feel good, you know. And I, I, but this is not the time. Sometimes to feel I want to feel like shit. Yeah, exactly. I like my depressing no, movies. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> but this time, it, but it just took me. It eventually it took me away both times. And like the second time I saw it, the day Carrie Fisher died, I felt like crap, you know. And I went and saw it, and I was just taken away. And, you know, that to me, like, just totally summed up, like, why we needed this movie. Yeah, right movie, right time. Yeah. I I think, you know, when John and I saw this, it was probably the best day of 2017. <laughs> well, until after we got out of the movie theater. 
So that's uh, that's our thoughts on La La Land. Um, I'm so sorry, John. I'm disappointed. <laughs> no, I'm disappointed in myself more than anything. <laughs> okay. I, I don't get it. I, I do not know how this happened. I I have never turned on a movie so quickly. <laughs> This is the, inside of a week. Romance. Inside of a week. Well, I mean, it has it has kooky romance, kooky, kooky romance, and fuck LA. <laughs> that city's hideous. I mean, yeah, yeah. And though this movie is interesting in the way it kind of romanticizes Los Angeles, no, it, it, it's kind of this weird juxtaposition of the reality of LA, like where everything you mm. see is like real yeah, LA yeah, locations, yeah. but it's all from this like really nostalgic fifties filter, which yeah. is interesting. Yeah. I don't know. It, it all looks gentrified. <laughs> I, I think this movie blends kind of the I like the idealism, like fantasy mm -hmm. ideas of it, like Los Angeles and Hollywood and everything with like reality. I think yeah. pretty well. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see like Damien Chazelle do like a, a New York versus LA movie. I think that could be really you interesting. You could read that Whiplash versus La La Land is that. Cause... That's that's true. Even though I think Whiplash is set in New York, but I think it was mostly it's filmed not... in Los Angeles. Yeah, well, well <laughs> everything's filmed in Los Angeles. Yeah. Well, it, it is what it is. Uh, anyway, that's. Uh, it's Damien Chazelle. Do we want to review potential top five of 2016? Um, we're running a bit long. Uh, okay. I don't know. I think we we could maybe just wrap up. I like, think just general thoughts. I think it's appropriate. We're we're recording this on the th what, what was it the third? Um, it's it's been a fucking awful year. <laughs> it's been a fucking awful year. Movies have been terrible. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, 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 I don't know. Um, a couple of people have said, and maybe they're right. Like. It's only been really terrible if you only focus on, like, the big movies. Like, this was a year when, like, there were a lot of, like, really interesting mm -hmm. small movies being made. And a lot of those movies, like, got a lot of attention. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's just, like, because, like, I'm seeing more, like, small movies now or, like, if there were just more of them. But, like, it, it seemed to me like there was a lot of, like, interesting, like, smaller stuff going on, like, throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Such as The Lobster. Yeah, such as The Lobster and, like, Green Room and my, I think, probably favorite movie of the year, uh, Don't Think Twice, which came out in, like, July. Oh, yeah, I, I haven't seen either of those, so maybe, I don't like, even, like, the small... Mm. The Everybody small... Wants Some came out in, like, March. Yeah. <laughs> All of, like, the small little indie movies that came out, even, I was disappointed even by those. I, I can't really think, I can't really think of a movie that really stood out this year. I mean, there is the, uh, the, uh, different filter copy-paste version of La La Land, Cafe Society. <laughs> Which was a uh, good I know eloquent. a movie that stuck out as very terrible. Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. <laughs> no, Suicide Squad, actually. <laughs> That movie was worse than Batman vs. Superman. Oh, no. You're the only one oh, of us who's seen that. Oh, this year? Yeah. Oh, oh. So um, I don't know if I'm ready to, like, issue my official top five yet, because there's still a few movies from 2016 that I need to see. Yeah. Um, including some stuff from, like, earlier in the year that I just mm -hmm. missed. Um, it's, it's a movie where I've oddly not seen that many new releases. Yeah. I don't think this year destroyed my faith in movies. If no, anything, no, I... Th no, no truly, no bad <laughs> year can destroy my faith in movies. I, there's a lot of stuff I'm excited for this year. Um, even bigger stuff. Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2. Uh, Logan. 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 I'm Logan. so looking forward yeah, to Logan. Logan. That actually looks pretty good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Regardless of whether it's good or not, at least be fucking interesting. That's all I want yeah. for new superhero movies <laughs> we're, anymore. We're going to have to rewatch The Wolverine around the time <laughs> that, be... that Logan comes out. An X Men Origins <laughs> Wolverine. Oh, okay, I'm. No. Uh, oh no! Oh, that movie's fucking hilarious. No one, no one can force me to watch that. Uh, <laughs> X Men. What? X Men Origins Wolverine. Oh. The one with the bad Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just no. I also realize this. Like, what big movie last year was some was an original idea? Uh, you mean. Besides, you mean like was was like an original property? An original property. Um, I, that's kind of like the watershed for me. Arrival? Is that a thing? It, it's bigger it's than. It's bigger. It was financed by a major studio, yeah. and I really did not like that movie as much as everybody else seemed to. Uh, but mm -hmm. I don't know. There were there were a couple that were. I that guess, one. yeah, Zootopia and Zootopia wasn't oh, yeah, Zootopia. Uh, That's also Disney. So. Edge of 17 wasn't based on anything. 
No, but that's I not. call that movie mm-hmm. well, Edge of Seventeen. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We man. saw it at seventeen. But... Yeah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> we've got a we've got a lot uh, coming up that I am that I'm interested in. Yeah. Uh, I am optimistic for Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk. Good for you. <laughs> we will have to do the Nolan episode eventually. Uh, are we just going to save that? Uh, do do we? So what are, what are we going to? We have to decide what we're doing next week. Yeah, um, we we talked about doing like. An episode where we kind of like called ourselves on our own BS and yeah. like looked at stuff like we we don't really like because but I that, have, we, that one of us likes but the other doesn't because yeah, I have liked Birdman less and less every time mm. I've watched it and um you know I feel like I I may uh, not love that movie as much as I used to yeah. um I don't know I've got a list going here um Let's see. And, and I was thinking like of course like, we'd have to do Christopher like fucking David Fincher but we'd maybe do like Christopher Nolan yeah because that's a director where I'm just I'm not on board well because I Nolan I think we are going to have to re-examine Interstellar at yeah. some point oh no <laughs> that is something I'm interested in well, I, I, I I need to rewatch that movie yes. I, I need to go back and look at it and um I, I also kind of want to look at Memento again What's the big fucking deal with Nolan? I just can't I, I know you, you, well you I like Nolan I mean I at least like you know, Dark the director Knight. Nolan. I like D- Nolan as a director. I love Dark Knight. I love Inception. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. John is much more skeptical about everything <laughs> involving. Think... Dark. I'll defend Dark Knight because well, I think Dark Knight works because I he that is a movie where he's working with pre-established, really big operatic characters, mm-hmm. so he can't just do the all of these characters are monoliths that represent things in the story. Do we just want to? pull the trigger and do a Miyazaki week. Okay. <laughs> pull it. Mm. Pull it. Well, for the I, sake of fun. Because I, I had, I have some things written down. Uh, we still, uh, we were still, we were always, we were still thinking about uh, Vim Vendor's week. Vim Vendor's week. Yeah. What, uh, what I we think do? we should knock that out early in the semester because both the movies we would do for that are over two hours. Yeah. I found a couple of noirs by the same director when I was browsing around vidiots that I Ooh. think could be interesting. Um, Ooh. I also think uh, I was looking. Carol Reed has done some other movies that yes, are pretty yes. acclaimed, uh, based on how much we all loved the Third Man. Mm-hmm. I, think, I, th- I think doing like a Carol Reed week would be um, interesting. I think I think that would, that would be good. Um, I think we should do maybe like Night Train to Munich and yeah, yeah. Uh, something else. I know, I, I've been I, I've been curious about Night Train to Munich. Yeah. Um, what uh, What do we want to do here? I think Miyazaki Week might be a good because I okay. I've, I've had like yeah. Howl's Moving Castle on okay. the mind for a while. Also, time. also we've been putting off uh, Italian Neorealism Week like for oh, ages. Oh yeah, we need to get that out. We're gonna have to get around to that eventually. Well, what would we do? Would well, we do Rome Open City and Bicycle Thieves. I think or? so. Maybe we can wait on that because I'm taking a history of international film yeah. class this semester, and we might watch Bicycle Thieves for that class. Yeah. Well, I think I'm also taking. A, I'm taking a. Uh, class on German film and okay. I think we might we could do like because along with Italian neorealism there's also other movements like German rubble film which mm. is kind of the same concept okay. I mean we could look at some of those we'll we'll look into it um, alright for, for this week uh, yeah I think we'll, we'll, we'll let's do some Miyazaki movies <laughs> yeah. so what are we going to um so you you want to do Howl's Moving Howl's Castle? Yeah. I, I think we just Howl's... need to get that out of the way. Okay, that, <laughs> that's that's a mess, but I cannot stop talking about it. What do we think about doing uh, one of his last The Wind Rises? Ooh, Ooh. I, I haven't seen The Wind Rise. That oh yeah, that'd be that. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like we're that's both a... highly into that. Yeah. I mean... Oh wait, I've seen the movie. Neither well, you have. Uh, I guess because so. I've seen The Wind Rises. No, I've seen The Wind Rises. Oh okay. Oh, you you think you think I was going to miss The Wind Rises? Yes. <laughs> I think that could be interesting. Look at kind of mm-hmm. one of his like more. We could just do. We could just blow our load into Miyazaki month for shits and giggles. Uh, we we could do that. Um, Let's not that, do that. I think I think we'll we'll do Miyazaki movies kind of intermittently from yeah. here on out. Um, because like he's we've, we've got too many ideas bouncing around to yeah. just solely commit to that for like the next month. Oh, yeah. But yeah. all right, so next week. Howl's Moving Castle, and I guess The Wind the, Rises. The Wind Rises, yeah. All right. All right. Interesting. We can look at uh, his his last completed film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Although, did, did he direct The Red Turtle, or, or was that... No, we yeah. think that just, he, okay. he didn't direct that. Um, here's the thing. With The Wind Rises, I think we're all going to be pretty on board with that one. I think Howl's Moving Castle, we're all going to kind of be... Um, clash. I, I think there will be a clash of that one. All right. Well, we'll, we'll see. I think for better and for worse. All right. Miyazaki Week. 
uh, the first of many, probably, yeah. coming your way. Yeah, and, and the shit-tastic year of 2017. Fuck you, Andy Zaltz. <laughs> in theory, I could put visuals with this podcast, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. I guess we that could requires way too much time. I yeah. guess we could film ourselves. With the well, no, because I could do a screen recording when we record it on Skype. That, uh, that would be all too easy. But then, I don't know. But um, then you could see the varying degrees of my terrible, lazy <laughs> facial hair. Yeah, I think it's better. Um, yeah. We keep we keep this audio only. By the way, I, I looked briefly into um, getting us onto other platforms this week. Okay. Such as SoundCloud. Such as SoundCloud. All, all of them cost at least some money. Uh, so I was like, well, that's, uh, that's the end of that. <laughs> We'd be at a loss. Uh, or <laughs> I, I, unless I can find some free way to set up an RSS feed, because to, to get onto iTunes requires one. I'm not even sure how RSS feeds work. So I, I think until we get decent microphones, I'm not going to think yeah. about other platforms. Well, I was thinking, like, until we do this for other reasons than we just want to, <laughs> I think... <laughs> Um, I can't see a, it's, a, it's a, a day where that wouldn't yeah. be the case. Uh, apparently, like the platform the idiots use is like at like five bucks a month, and I was like, why? Why? Why do they do this? <laughs> I mean, if we're like that's more than my New York Times subscription. <laughs> I am curious what it would be like to devote yourself to like t to give an auteurist vision, an auteurist take on a terrible filmmaker, <laughs> and what that would mean in every well, every yeah. week. So like I don't Tommy know. was says the room. Oh God, I don't even know. No, I didn't know. <laughs> Maybe Neil <laughs> Green. Know. Just like you didn't yeah. say you had water. You didn't say you had water. Well, it's implied. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. <laughs> Good job, Mr. Ocarina. Good job. You have done it. You've converted another. For, for those who don't know, <laughs> that album, Todd Rundgren agreed to produce that album because he thought it was a hilarious parody <laughs> of Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> and the more I listen to Springsteen, the more I see it. I totally get why they thought it was a parody. 